Hello, and welcome to Expected Value, the podcast that goes inside the sports analytics world. I'm Paul Carr from True Media. We're back. Got a little vacation time in with school out here in the Midwest and before the summer's international soccer tournaments really get started. Ready to keep the pod going now. This is episode 65 of the show. I guess it's the Gary Zimmerman episode. The Vikings Broncos Hall of Fame lineman was the best player I found who wore 65. And what we really should have done is plan better. So this is on me. This should have been, should have made this be episode 66, because then it's undoubtedly the Mario Lemieux episode. And we're talking hockey on the show today. Our guest is Allison Lucan, one of the leading NHL analysts on TV today. She's with the Seattle Kraken, also does writing for their site as well. She approaches her job from an analytical bent, working numbers and information into her commentary more than most in her profession do. She doesn't come from a data science background. I think that makes her story and approach more interesting. So on this show, Allison and I will talk about her career path to hockey and hockey analytics, how and why she began studying the numbers as a hockey journalist, what data is out there available for NHL analysis, at least in the public sphere, how that's evolving, numbers she looks at to prepare for games or look at games and in-game, uh, the challenges of communicating data on TV, keys to getting numbers across more clearly, the importance of the hockey analytics community online and in real life, uh, and her time as the Richmond Spiders mascot. Didn't see that one coming, did you? Uh, then our resident Florida Panthers fan, producer Sergio De La Esprea, will join me to react and wrap things up. Without further ado, here is the expected value conversation with Seattle Kraken hockey analyst Allison Lucan. We're joined now on Expected Value by Allison Lucan, on air analyst and writer for the Seattle Kraken. Allison, thank you for joining us on the show. Let's start with your path because you don't have a you know, data science background like I don't either. So let's just start there. What did you study? Go back to college at the University of Richmond. And what did you do initially after school? <laughs> yeah, I have a very uh, untraditional path. I uh, went to University of Richmond and studied leadership studies. At the time, it was the only school that wasn't affiliated with a branch of the military that was offering study of leadership. So that was a part of the big reason I went down there. And uh, like a lot of people at that time, if you didn't know exactly what you wanted to do yet, you became a consultant. So um, I started as a technology consultant and that evolved over a lot of years into doing more strategic planning and communications planning and organizational design work before I left it all behind and decided to become a writer for hockey. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll come back to that background in a bit. How did you catch the hockey bug? What led to the transition into hockey journalism first? Yeah, it's, it's again, really, cr now that there's been some time, it's crazy to look at how this whole thing turned out. But uh, I was always a sports fan. Uh, it was a big thing that my dad and I would do together was take in a lot of different sports. Um, and I grew up in central Ohio, which uh, if people know that's known for a lot of college football. So uh, I, I was actually voted my superlative in high school was biggest sports fan. So I should have maybe seen this coming, but uh, was usually following just football. And as I moved around for my job, my consulting job, I ended up in Washington, D.C. for a few years and started following the Caps, just started following the game. I hadn't really grown up with a lot of access to hockey. So this was really the first time it was, quote unquote, in my backyard. So started following them and then when my uh, husband and I ended up moving back to Columbus, the Blue Jackets were relatively new, started following the game, really fell in love with it. And uh, I was that cliche. I said, you know what I'll do? I'll start a blog. And uh, <laughs> that, that yeah. was my first foray into it. Okay. So then moved on your career, kind of progressed on the hockey journalism front. Uh, I think at least where you kind of entered my radar is when you, know, you started making a concerted effort to dive into hockey analytics and combine that with your journalism background. What prompted you to do that? Yeah, it's a, it's twofold, really. Um, the one is a little less fortunate than the other. And the first is um, I had been writing about the game and doing, you know, entry level basic analysis for a little while. And when I got my first paying job, uh, the bosses that I had said that I was not allowed to write about actual hockey. I could do off ice features. I could do community profiles. 
Um, and, you know, as a woman, I needed to find a way to, to prove that I knew what I was talking about. And analytics really gave a foundational structure for that. Um, and similarly, at the same time, as I was watching games, I would look at the stats that we were being presented with publicly, like on a scoreboard or what have you. And my mind was telling me that those numbers weren't really telling us the whole story of what was happening in the game. And that just so happened to coincide with what was one of the big evolutions of public analytics for hockey and found that community and they were warm and embracing and, and just was really able to evolve my understanding and learning from there. So what, what steps specifically did you take? Because I think you did more than just, I'm going to read about it. I think you know, taught yourself some things, if I'm not mistaken. What steps did you take? Because you went headlong into hockey analytics world. Yeah, you know, I, uh, it was, Twitter was available to us. It was a great time to connect with people. It removed so many geographic barriers from finding people to talk to. So I was connecting with people there. And um, the hockey analytics community is known for doing these little grassroots conferences all over virtual or in person and, and really plugged into that network and just would learn from people who are doing public work. And every once in a while, you get a team employee coming to talk, learning from them. And um, I was a master Excel user, but I also started to realize that you had to be able to do more um, efficiently and quickly and better. Um, so I'm still a beginner by most comparisons, but uh, learned R, got into that world, learned some basic Tableau as well. And again, just continue to find ways, usually in the off season, to hopefully learn at least one new thing um, in addition to everything that I can pick up from my colleagues who are in the public space. So you mentioned that the hockey data revolution, whatever we want to call it, over the last decade or so. Can you tell us where we're at now, kind of hockey analytics-wise, data-wise, really? What's available at that NHL level, whether it's puck tracking, player tracking, et cetera? What's out there? Yeah, we're, we're kind of at a, actually, in a way, you know, I'm starting to hear this from a lot of people, too. We're kind of at a almost a disappointing point right now if you look at the public space, because I feel like we've mined of so much out of the data that we have publicly available. And we've also mined a lot of the great thinkers um, from our public space. They've been hired into teams as, as is often the case. We still have innovative work coming out of the minds of people like Micah Blake McCurdy. We have people like Corey Schneider who give us in the public space tracking data but when you look at where the data is evolving, that's all behind closed doors right now. You either have to have a really big wallet or be a team to pay some of these larger you know, data companies. And the tracking data that the league has just started to collect is finally just now becoming available to teams, but only to teams. So those of us in the public space, we are not necessarily getting this next wave of information that could feed deeper understandings or innovations, at least publicly, that's staying behind, behind the doors. And I really do hope that the game, the league, the sport can understand the value of expanding what they do share with the public, because it is a way to tie a very specific but growing segment of your fan base to the game in a much deeper way. Yeah. So it's fair to say the teams have access to the player tracking data. You don't have access to it as far as your broadcast job goes, correct? Well, so yeah, so if you work for a team or if you work for a broadcast, again, you probably have some, well, I don't, but companies have some of those deeper pockets where you can employ or work with some of the, the services that have data. I do not have access to the actual league tracking data that is chip-based. That is right now just with teams, but a lot of the optical tracking information that's gathered, um, I do have some access to that. Um, but, but honestly, a lot of what I share um, in my job is mostly from public sources because a part of my mission is to help educate people who are interested and help them connect to resources where they can continue to further their understanding and not black box it all the time. So you got into hockey analytics. Where was the? How did you transition from the journalist writer to now where you have much more of an on-air presence and role with the Kraken? Yeah, again, I, I look back and this is insane, um, but I must, I must give a shout out to um, my friend, my mentor, and also my boss at the Kraken, and that is Bob Condor, who is an elite, well-respected, well-tenured journalist. Um, he's been with the NHL, he's covered Michael Jordan, he's covered a whole bunch of things through a long and illustrious career, but um, he had found me actually during the pandemic when I didn't have a writing job. I was not doing anything in the hockey space as, as so many of us were affected by those two years. And he reached out and he wanted me to do just a little bit of writing. And 
just as an afterthought, as we had this wonderful phone call, he said, hey, have you, have you ever been on camera? Do you have anything you can send me? And we'd done a lot of work in terms of virtual uh, conferences during the pandemic. And I had had a couple interviews on TV. I sent it over to him. And when the Kraken invited me out for an interview, he said, we're going to have you do a screen test. And I assumed, you know, in my mind, a lot of teams across all sports, you have videos that live on your website where maybe, you know, a team representative is explaining something or doing an interview. That's what I assumed I was doing. And so after I went through some interviews with, with individuals who worked with the crack and he said, okay, now we're going to go to your screen test. I said, what do you mean? And we actually drove out to Root Sports Studios and I did a real live uh, screen test. And I was uh, lucky enough or fortunate enough to um, impress the right people. And uh, they took a great chance on me. And I have a tremendous team of professionals in the, in the TV and broadcast space over at Root Sports who hold my hand, teach me, mentor me, and have helped me turn my voice from one that is mostly written to one that is live and on TV. So in this current role on Air Analyst, let's, let's start with during a game. Just kind of want to go through some of your processes. During a game, what sort of data do you have access to? What are you looking at to get a sense and to reinforce something you're thinking or give you ideas about what's going on? Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, first and foremost, I'm watching the game um, and I usually give it about, you know, the first half of the first period to kind of you start to feel what's happening. Right. Or kind of start to draw your conclusions. And again, as I said, you know, for real time information publicly, I'm going to a lot of public sources. I'm going to the NHL website. I'm going to hockeyviz.com. I'm going to evolving hockey. I'm going to naturalstattrick.com using that data. And then, as I mentioned, we do have relationships with some of the bigger providers and I get a custom report um, at the end of every period that I'll hopefully sprinkle in as well. But I'm, I'm watching the game. I'm pulling up information on my iPad there and kind of going back and forth and seeing, as we all know, those, those of us who work with data where my eyes saw something right. And sometimes my eyes saw something wrong as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do you balance that kind of Start, I guess, starting with the numbers versus starting with what you've seen. How do you work those two things in balance as you go? Yeah, I think it's um, interesting. And you and I were talking about this a little bit before we came on air. But, you know, I think what's so important for any of us who work in data is to understand what the data we have tells us, but also where its weaknesses lie. And in hockey, we have a lot of weaknesses still. There's a lot of unknowns in terms of what our data can actually capture. So when I see a discrepancy, I think that's when it's actually interesting. That's when the cool, like, it's kind of boring to say, I thought they were good. And the data says, yeah, they were good. Right. And you're like, great, everything's fine. <laughs> um, but it's those gaps that I think can really compel us to dig deeper. And I think the first thing I do is when I see a big variance is I ask myself and I say, is there something that your eyes missed? And I'll kind of go through that kind of an evaluation. And then the second question I'm going to ask is, based on what I know that this data does or how it's captured or what it's, you know, formulaic uh, base is, are there gaps in what this number tells me? And that's why this is different. And I think, you know, knowing that and citing that are very important, but it's kind of an evolution of, of banging the two sides together and seeing if I can deduce what the answer is, or if we've just evolved to more questions that we need to answer going forward. So if you're, say it's post game, what are kind of, your go-to numbers that are beyond, you know, your traditional, you know, five to 10 that you typically see in a, a post-game score panel or something like that. What are the kinds of things you're looking for to capture a sense of what happened in that game? Yeah, I think with, um, there's one that is most publicly accessible and that's expected goals. This is a number that a lot of us see in a lot of different sports spaces too. And I like it because, as I mentioned, the data we see most readily in an NHL arena, for example, isn't telling the whole story. And expected goals doesn't just tell us how much offense was created. It tells us the quality of the offense that was created. And I like that too, because I think one of the most under, the misunderstood areas of our game is goaltending. And so I think telling the story of the workload of the goaltender from an expected goals perspective is also really important. The other thing that I really like to look at is the transition metrics. So zone entries and zone exits. I think that can tell us a lot about a game that's becoming faster and faster and much more skill-based every year. And so looking at how effectively a team can move the puck, you know, it's great to score a goal, but to score a goal, you have to shoot. And to shoot, you have to get into the zone at the first place. So that transition game is also something that I find really interesting and compelling. 
On the expected goals front, I'm curious what the process has been for you the last few years. Is the, I, I can speak to the soccer front, having worked extensively on that, and it's been you know eight nine years I think since I first got the number on a graphic at ESPN, and it you know it, it's fits and starts as far as acceptance and things like that. I'm curious what the what the reception has been for expected goals for you front in the hockey front. Yeah, you know it's been pretty good. Um, you know, as I said earlier, I think that. You know, if you're a fan that your desire of how you want to enjoy hockey is to sit in the stands and have a beer and a hot dog and just cheer and enjoy it, I think that's amazing. Um, but for people who want to dig a little deeper into the data side, it's good. I think that what I have done with it that has fed a better ex- uh, acceptance, at least in my opinion, is I really try to take terms and turn them into as accessible language as possible. So while we can talk about expected goals, we know what that means. When I'm talking publicly, I'm usually saying shot quality. So I like to make it something that makes sense to someone who's maybe hearing it or seeing it for the first time. Um, And I think that resonates a lot better with people than, you know, because then there's always the joke, expected by whom? What's expected? I I didn't expect anything. Exactly. exactly. So, um, you know, I'll say that or I'll even um, go even more colloquial sometimes and say, you know, those shots where you go, oh, and you react. Mm -hmm that's shot quality. Right. So, so that's how I do it. And I, I think people are, are vibing with it. And it's, it is one of the cool things about being in Seattle with a new team is we have a fan base that knows a lot about the game, but also is learning about it at an NHL level. And so they're really hungry to learn about it. And I'm so happy that we're providing them a lot of their foundation in ways that I think are, are most important. Yeah. That's interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way. Like if you start in this role for whatever the Rangers Bruins original six team, you think you probably would have been, it just would have been a little bit different for you than compared to starting with a Kraken? Yeah, you know, I think um, I think it might be because I think what I, my opinion, again, uh, that I'm learning is a successful broadcast fits in with its fan base and its community, right? And so I think that when we look at what Seattle is all about, it's a very, you know, smart um, technology, data-focused community um, that really likes to understand and dig into things. And I think that the way we are talking about the game suits that market. Um, I think there might be other markets. You know, I used to cover the Columbus Blue Jackets, and there was a big part of that community that enjoyed the work I did as well. So I don't know that it would be different. I could see that it could be. But again, it's all about fitting where your fan base is, what they want to learn, or if they don't know it yet, are they in a place where they're interested in that kind of thing? You mentioned on the communication front, you mentioned uh, speaking the language with shot quality and maybe instead of expected goals, depending on the audience. What else is key to communicating data clearly, whether it's TV, writing, whatever it might be? Yeah, I mean, I think, and, you know, we've come so far in this space, even in the time that I've been writing about hockey. But if you looked at an article 10, even 12 years ago, you know, you were seeing mostly words and maybe, you know, a a ggplot graph or something of that nature. I think that what we can do to make data more accessible and more accepted is to continue to bring in the work that is visual based. So be that not just a graph or not just a table, but you know, showing a rink visually and showing shot locations on the rink, bringing in video clips. I think that's been really, really huge for me is to be able to say, I'm going to tell you this player is good at this thing. And then I'm going to show you a clip of this player being good at this thing. <laughs> um, and you know, co- contrasting that because again, we want people to understand what they're seeing and understand why it matters or why it made an impact on the outcome of the game or what a player could or couldn't do. So I think leaning very, very heavily on whatever visualization you can is huge. Yeah. What, what else is challenging just from a TV standpoint, which is obviously a different medium than writing. What, what else is challenging about trying to get a, a stat or, or data point across on television? <laughs> yeah. You know, I think um, even some of the big, you know, national broadcasts, we aren't necessarily equipped yet to as readily turn around the visuals that I'm talking about. A video clip is fine, um, but you know it's helping your editors learn what you want to highlight in a package or what you want to show or where to pause in a video versus what maybe traditionally has been shown. I was, I was having this debate actually with my producer um, over dinner a couple of days ago, and I said, if you watch in hockey, it's a very traditionally accepted fact that when a goal is scored, first you see the whole play. 
And then the second cut is the pass that leads to the shot that leads to the goal. And the final shot is just of the individual shooter sending the puck into the net. Whereas when I'm thinking about the play, I want to see it big. Then I want to see it close. And then my final look, I want to see big again, because I've now started to figure out why it happened. Um, so I think, you know, changing the way we think about how we present information and ultimately on broadcast too, there is the limitation of what data you can even get and then understanding or having the skill set in your team at, on a broadcast to turn that data into a visual quickly and accurately that isn't just tables or numbers or things like that. Yeah. Kind of on the communication front and going back to something we talked about earlier, you've sort of answered this over the course of the conversation, but that corporate consulting background that you kind of started your career as, how do you see that informing what you do on air now? Well, it certainly gives me the ability to talk and think on my feet because <laughs> I've had to give a ton of presentations and, and you know, answer a lot of proposals and convince someone that, you know, they should work with us or that they should hire us. But I think it does speak to why I'm so comfortable with data, too, is that when you're a consultant, as we all know, or if you're any kind of contract-based employee, you have to find a way to prove your worth. And so for me, when we come to hockey, it goes back to what I said earlier. You can't, you can't just say they're good. Why are they good? How good are they? And so it's that kind of a, a critical thinking thought process, if you will, that lends itself to the way that I like to use data in my hockey analysis. You mentioned the hockey analytics community and the different conferences and whatnot, and how important that was to getting you involved in the sport. It seems like, you know, I'm a little more of an outsider to the hockey-specific uh, analytics community. It seems like that's a very tight-knit group with these conferences, gatherings. What makes that group maybe special or different from your perspective? Yeah, I think it's just, it's, it's funny because when hockey analytics really kind of started to bloom, um, they didn't have the best reputation. Uh, we were viewed as arrogant, you know, as all data, data, data. There was the colloquial, you know, watch the game nerd was the, was the common response. Um, but I think, you know, what happened was the very first time there was even a small gathering, at least as, as the lore and our forefathers, if you will tell it, is that it was a group of friends who just wanted to get together um, and actually one of the key people who had started writing publicly about analytics had unfortunately passed away. And so they wanted to get together to just be with each other and share that space. And that bred this idea of saying, we're the only people who are doing this. Hockey is not widely accepted as doing analytics work yet. Let's come together and let's share ideas and let's see what's happening. And, you know, out of that, real friendships have formed um, we've even got people who've gotten married who met at hockey analytics conferences for the first time. But I think that we were just very lucky to the first people who started these really created a culture of openness and acceptance and welcoming and no judgment, regardless of where your knowledge level is. And I think we all have benefited from that. And so it is very, very important that we carry on that mindset and just help our community grow, even if we, some of us can still tend to be jerks online from time to time. <laughs> so it sounds like that's a good place for someone to start getting into hockey analytics. Where else would you point somebody, whether it's a gathering site, if someone wants to get into either the sport through analytics or analytics through the sport? Yeah, you know, I think now there are, um, there aren't as many blogs, obviously, anymore. But, um, you know, there are great writers out there. There are a ton of great podcasts that are coming up. Um, we just have a, a new one launched called Expected by Whom, back on our expected yeah. goals pun. But uh, um, there are great podcasts. And, you know, truly do, if you're comfortable with using Twitter in these times, if it's still around and not broken on right. a given day, yeah, um, that's where a lot of us live. And, you know, find one and just if you're open and respectful and willing to learn and have a conversation, most of us want to do that too um, and just soak up that information. I would also say that a blessing to come out of the pandemic is that, as I mentioned, a lot of these conferences ended up being virtual for at least two years. And so if you Google or search hockey analytics conference, or we also call them hacks uh, for short, you can find a lot of the videos that are out there um, to teach you everything from the foundational concepts to big thinking ideas, to panels, to what comes next. Um, they're all over parts of hockey. There are women's hockey analytics conferences. It's they're all over the country. So it's it, all over the continent, I should say. So it's really exciting. Nice. Great. All right. And we'll link to some of that in our show notes as well. Uh, let's get you out of here with our playing favorite segment where we rip through a number of your favorites uh, to get to know you a little bit. So let's start with what is your favorite number and why? 
My favorite number is 15, and that is because the player that I had the most fun watching, who actually flies in the face of everything the analytics tells us, wore 15 uh, for the Columbus Blue Jackets, and that was Derek Dorsett. Ah, so who was your favorite athlete as a kid? As a kid, outside of WWF wrestling, <laughs> I think that it was probably Michael Jordan. That was pretty special to be around for. Yeah, hard, hard to top that. Uh, you're in Seattle a lot now, obviously, working with the Kraken. Yep. So I'll ask the drink question. Favorite coffee place and order in Seattle? Well, as our corporate partners are Starbucks, I have to say, I actually do. I, I, I go to Starbucks. I mean, I do love, um, there's great local coffee shops. If I'm not at Starbucks, I'm probably at Macrina on First Avenue, which I love. And my go-to order is a bra hot, because you have to clarify now, a hot latte with oat milk and brown sugar syrup. Ooh. As a non-coffee drinker, that sounds dangerous. <laughs> I, I appreciate the passion that coffee drinkers have as well. Oh, yes. Uh, so your favorite part of going back to your college days, being the Richmond Spiders mascot Spidey in college. <laughs> I think my favorite thing was just seeing how much happiness and joy you can bring to people just by walking around in a crazy costume. Um, it's the simple things, right? And I think that's what sport is all about. It's about entertainment and having fun. And to do that in a little way was really cool. Nice. And finally, you have a favorite, how did I get here moment? You're just kind of a cool, able to soak it in moment since you've taken this role at the Kraken and, and you're able to just appreciate kind of where you've gotten here. Yeah. I, you know, I do have a ton of pinch me moments a lot. I've shared some of them here, but Last year in our inaugural season, um, our brilliant color commentator, JT Brown, was unfortunately diagnosed with COVID and was unable to travel with the team. And the team asked me to fill in for him with the legend, John Forsland. And so I had the privilege, totally unproven, for our entire team and our entire broadcast team to take a, take a leap of faith and put me in the booth with like two days notice and call four games. And uh, I remember being in Toronto, obviously a legendary place, being in Toronto and looking over and realizing I have called games with John Forsland. And that is such a privilege, privilege and such an honor that I, I don't think I'll ever forget that. That's great. Good story to end with. Uh, Allison Lucan, on-air analyst and writer for the Seattle Kraken. We appreciate you joining us here on Expected Value. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Back in the True Media studios, I'm Paul Carr. Thanks again to Allison Lucan for joining us on the show. Follow her on Twitter, at Allison L. That's Allison with one L and then an L at the end. You can check our show notes for links to that or links to her work and other articles about her. I'm joined now by producer Sergio De La Estrella, who may or may not have slept last night. We're recording this the day after Stanley Cup Final Game 3, which the Panthers won in overtime for the first ever win in the final. Sergio, first of all, how are we holding up? How are you doing? I just want to say I'd like to personally thank Matthew Kachuk and Carter Verhage. <laughs> um, they've both been here a combined like three seasons or something like that. And they already, I think, are like two and three in the all time playoff performers list in Florida Panthers history. So uh, it is a good day when Matthew Kachuk and Carter Verhage are a part of your hockey team. So it is a good day, Paul. Is John Van Beesbrook number one? Is he still number one or who you got? I th honestly, I think it's Barkoff, who's our captain and uh -huh. playing right now. Van Beesbrook is 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 definitely in, in terms of cult heroes. Yes, but right. not as many points. Not as many points, of course. <laughs> fewer uh, points. Yeah. Fewer points. Absolutely. Oh, but well. no, no. Yeah, I, I did get um, some sleep last night. I did push my alarm a half hour this morning, right. but uh you know, it's a it's a good day, and I don't have that much time to enjoy it because we are recording here June 9th. Right. Uh, Paul's talking about Game Three on June 8th, and uh, I have a Miami Heat game to worry about. So, <laughs> boy, juggling those at the same time—that's something. Just, it's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, but yeah. I'm glad to be doing it. Glad you're holding up. All right. Okay, Thanks. so you watch uh, more hockey than I do. Uh, what did you take away from the talk with Allison? I thought it was a great conversation. Um, it's funny because I had seen Allison on TV because I have the ESPN Plus um, power play feature, like mm -hmm. the equivalent of League Pass in the NBA or Red right. Zone in the NFL. Um, and so I do a lot of late night hockey watching, especially during the season, obviously not during the offseason, but I do a lot of late night watch hockey watching. And it was cool to see and like put a recognize like, oh, yeah, that's right. I've seen this person and and doing her job and, and being really good at it. Uh, I think one of the coolest things that she mentioned was the fact that she purposely uses publicly available data when mm -hmm. she's on the air 
So that way, if people need to go and or they kind of get the bug, either the hockey bug or the analytics bug, they can go and figure out, hey, you know, what is um, the zone entry percentage and why is that important? You know, right. why is it that this team keeps playing the puck behind the net rather than shooting directly at it? You know, so I like having those. Um, I like having people in those positions because it's people like Allison that are truly going to help grow the game. And it's in any facet right here today. We're talking hockey, of course. Um, but it, it is still a very young um, space hockey mm-hmm. analytics is. And, you know, I've been on sites like natural hat trick and stuff like that before, because I, as crazy, crazy statement, Paul, but I do like sports data. It's kind of crazy that nerd. Uh, yeah, I know. Crazy how that, how that works. But, you know, I've been on those sites and she's right. You know, there isn't as much, publicly available data as there is for um, something like baseball or even football or soccer. So Mm -hmm. um, I really enjoyed that aspect of it. And I think my favorite part was the fact that she said the local broadcast has to a good local broadcast will cater towards the market that they are servicing. And I think that that's very important, again, in the grow the game aspect. Um, And if you can find a way to educate an audience without kind of a over explaining things and B maybe saying some things that are kind of off putting to our quote unquote um, traditional sports watchers, you know, maybe not as much with sports data, like we've talked about in the past, then we can, again, the thesis of true media, then we can mend that bridge come together and we can find a way to um, integrate and grow the way that we as a society watch sports and the importance of the numbers behind it. So I love that. And I thought that, uh, I think someone like Allison in a position of of influence like that is is wonderful to have in not just hockey, but in sports analytics in general. Yeah, and that kind of leads to one of my main takeaways. Like Allison obviously did not have a data science, math, stats, whatever background uh, like so many you know analysts do today. Uh, what she did have was she mentioned leadership studies, but more than that is just the communication. And I know I say this almost every pod, but the importance and value of those soft, intangible skills, whatever you want to call them, I don't think can be overstated in the data analytics space because, you know, you can be the smartest data scientist, analyst, whatever, but if you can't get it across to someone who probably then has to explain it to somebody else, uh, clearly there's no value in it. Uh, As people have said, you know, I have the best model in the world, but if I can't communicate it, then it's pretty much worthless. Um, So I say that for people who want to get into the field, Take a class, take a public speaking class, take a writing class, take one of these things that will, it obviously won't contribute directly to you, you know, writing your algorithms better. I mean, maybe it will, who knows, but it just lets you communicate better and get that information across. It's super important. Uh, It can separate you from, you know, you're a job applicant out of hundreds of people. It helps you with interviews. It's just such a valuable skill being comfortable in front of people. Like Allison mentioned, you're dealing with different kinds of questions and fast paced, whatever it might be. Those are all things that she picked up from kind of the corporate consulting world. So all those things, I'm not saying you have to like major in public speaking or something like that, but you know, take a couple classes. People always ask, what do you study in college? Well, pick your, you know, math, science, whatever it is, throw in a public speaking class or two or writing class or two, something that can just make you stand out a little bit more. And you never know when that's going to be handy for Allison. She kind of stumbled into a TV job because she was you know, just pretty good on her feet. And pretty good presenting yourself publicly. You never know, not necessarily something that extreme, but those things help you a lot. Yeah. That's one of the things that I personally um, feel has helped me the most in my professional career from my theater degree, from my time as an actor. Um, and listen, like sports analytics, just like English, Spanish, French, Portuguese, Italian, it's a language. Just like when you learn how to read and write music, that's a language. And so if you are able to communicate that language properly, and are able to educate others, then maybe a lot more people can be fluent in sports analytics. And like we said, that's how you grow the game. And so I think that's fantastic advice, Paul. And I think that, you know, Allison, again, is an example of someone that um, applied those things throughout the course of her entire professional and personal life um, and <laughs> ended up with a on the spot. Hey, let's go do a screen yeah, test, which I, I I personally would love because I love that imp- improvisation think on your feet. But I know a lot of people may not. And so Allison clearly did well because we get to see her on Root Sports covering um, the Seattle Kraken. So 
All right. Thanks, Sergio. Thanks again to our guest, Allison Lucan. We have other hockey guests in the archives, including from the Seattle Kraken, Namita Nandakumar, who's in Senior data analyst there. She was at the time, at least. Asma Tume, then of Hockey Graphs, has also been on the show. So you can check those out uh, in our show archives. We appreciate ratings, reviews, sharing of the podcast, however you can. All of that is helpful to help keep us growing as well. On behalf of Sergio De La Esprilla and all of us here at True Media, I'm Paul Carr. Thank you for listening to Expected Value, the podcast that goes inside the sports analytics world.